Hi guys, welcome to another episode of At Age of Logger, Law for the Everyday Layman. Today we continue with our discussion on the powers of corporations and we'll pick up where we left off. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this video or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Okay? Now, let's continue with the uh, discussion on the powers of uh, corporation. No? Uh, we last discussed the power to uh, deny preemptive right and now we can move on to the power of sale or other disposition of assets. Since a corporation may own property, as a consequence of such ownership, it may sell, lease, exchange, mortgage, pledge, or otherwise dispose of its property and assets upon such terms and conditions and for such consideration, which may be money, stock, bonds, or other instruments for the payment of money or other property or consideration. Take note that there is a uh, distinction here. A, corp a corporation can do a normal disposition of its property and assets, meaning not all, okay, not all or substantially all of its property of a or, or assets, especially if it is necessary in the usual and regular course of business or if the proceeds of the disposition will be appropriated for the conduct of remaining business and in case it's not a disposition of all or substantially all the assets all that is required is a majority vote of the board and compliance with the philippine competition act and other related laws okay but if the sale involves all or substantially all of the corporation's properties and assets, then there are additional rules. The requisites for disposition are as follows. First, of course, majority vote of the board approving the sale or other disposition. The written notice of the proposed disposition and time and place of the meeting should be sent personally and if allowed electronically to the stockholders. And then the vote of the board must be ratified by the vote of the stockholders representing two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or members at, the me at a meeting duly called for the purpose. And in this case, if there are dissenting stockholders, they may exercise their appraisal right in case of a sale of all or substantially all of the property or assets of the corporation but this right is not available if the disposition is only in the ordinary course of business meaning it's not all or substantially all of the assets huh? the appraisal right can only be exercised in case of a disposition of all or substantially all the properties okay Take note that even after such authorization or approval by the stockholders or members, the board or of directors or trustees may nevertheless, in its discretion, it may abandon the disposition of property or assets, subject of course to the rights of third parties under any contract relating thereto without further action or approval by the stockholders or members. Okay? So let's move on to the next power, which is the power to acquire its own shares. Now generally, a corporation cannot purchase its own shares if it will violate the trust fund doctrine. Remember that under the trust fund doctrine, the assets of a corporation represented by its capital stock are a trust fund to be, man to be maintained unimpaired and to be used to pay corporate creditors. Okay? A stock corporation can only purchase or acquire its own shares subject to the limitations that first, the acquisition is for a legitimate corpor corporate purpose or purposes and second, there should be unrestricted retained earnings in its books to cover the shares acquired. The law also gives some instances when the power can be exercised and this list is not exclusive, okay? First, a corporation can acquire its own shares to eliminate fractional shares. Fractional shares are shares which are, of course, less than one share, a fraction, no? One half, one fourth, whatever. 
in the example given by uh, De Leon, no? if a stockholder owns 250 shares and a corporation declares a 25% stock dividend, his total shares will now be 312 and one half. Okay, you get that by adding 62 and a half to his 250 shares. Now, fractional shares, the one half I mentioned earlier, they cannot be represented at meetings. So the corporation may purchase that fractional share from the stockholder or it may issue fractional script certificates to the stockholder who may now sell that to other stockholders who can now convert those into full shares. One half plus one half equals one whole. No? And there are other instances when fractional shares may result such as stock splits where a corporation divided it, divides its shares into multiple shares to boost liquidity or in cases of mergers or consolidation. Okay? Now, a corporation may also acquire its own shares to collect or compromise an indebtedness or a debt to the corporation arising out of unpaid subscription in a delinquency sale and to purchase delinquent shares sold during said sale. Okay? Other instances where the corporation may acquire its own shares, I'll give you a quick list. First, to pay dissenting or withdrawing stockholders entitled to payment for their shares. Second, to acquire treasury shares. Third, in case of redeemable shares even without retained earnings. Fourth, to decrease capital stock. And fifth, in closed corporations where there is deadlock in management. Now, the power to acquire its own shares is subject to limitations. First of all, the capital should not be impaired. It also should uh, be for a legitimate and proper corporate purpose or purposes. And there should be unrestricted retained earnings which, be, with, which will be used for the acquisition. The corporation should further act in good faith and without prejudice to the rights of stockholders and creditors and this, uh, the exercise of this power must be warranted by the condition of corporate affairs. Okay. Now let's move on to the next power which is the power to invest corporate funds in another corporation or business or for any other purpose. Okay. Remember that the corporation may be organized with a primary purpose and one or more secondary purposes. Generally, investment of corporate funds is limited to the primary purpose or to an investment reasonably necessary to accomplish its primary purpose, meaning investment in another business which is incident or auxiliary to the primary purpose. And in this case, this does not need approval of the stockholders as a majority vote of the board will suffice. And in this case, a dissenting stockholder, he cannot exercise his appraisal right because the investment of funds is in pursuance of the primary purpose. However, if the investment of funds or property is in any other corporation, business, or for any purpose other than the primary purpose for which it was organized, then it should be limited to those which are enumerated in the articles as secondary purposes. And to validly perform this act, there must not only be, be there must not only be majority vote by the board, but written notice of the meeting must be personally sent or if allowed electronically sent to the stockholders where they have to ratify that action by a vote representing at least two thirds of the outstanding capital stock or two thirds of the members in case of non stock corporations. In this case, now a dissenting stockholder may exercise his appraisal right. Okay? Now let's move on to the next power, which is the power to declare dividends. And let's begin with the definition of a dividend, which is a portion of the profits of the corporation which is set aside. Take note set aside, declared and ordered by the directors to be paid to the stockholders based on their shareholdings either on demand or at a fixed time. It is a payment to the stockholders as a return on their investment. So dividends come from profits and profits are a source of dividends but profits per se, they are not dividends until they are set aside and declared by the board. 
Okay? The Board of a Stock Corporation has the power to declare dividends out of the unrestricted retained earnings, which dividends may be payable as a cash dividend, property dividend, or stock dividend to the shareholder on the basis of the outstanding capital stock held by them. Since the board has the power to declare dividends, the board is at liberty to decide whether or not it should declare dividends, subject to the qualification found in paragraph 2 of section 42, okay? Section 42 and the law on improperly accumulated earnings tax. Okay, that's in the tax code, huh? The purpose of that uh, improperly accumulated earnings tax is to penalize corporations who are avoiding payment of the 10% final tax on distribution of dividends. In other words, as a general rule, the board has no legal obligation to distribute all its retained earnings as dividends, even if there are retained earnings, okay? even if there are profits. Just because there are profits does not mean the board has to uh, declare dividends. No. However, take note of paragraph 2 of section 42 where it says that stock corporations are prohibited from retaining surplus profits in excess of 100% of their paid in capital stock. So in this case, no, the board has to declare dividends. And this is consistent with the rule on uh, improperly accumulated uh, in earnings tax okay take note however that even if the surplus profits of the corporation exceed 100 percent of their paid in capital stock the law gives us instances when the board will be justified in not declaring dividends as follows first meaning uh, meaning to be clear meaning the board uh, can uh, retain earnings past 100% of the paid-in capital stock and they will not be required to distribute dividends. These are the instances. First, when justified by definite corporate expansion projects or programs approved by the board or when the corporation is prohibited under any loan agreement with financial institutions or creditors, whether local or foreign, from declaring dividends okay, without their consent. And such consent has not yet been secured. In other words, they uh, have a loan from a uh, bank, no? And uh, the conditions of the loan say that you cannot declare dividends unless the bank gives its consent, okay? Or another instance is when it can be clearly shown that such retention is necessary under special circumstances obtaining in the corporation, such as when there is a need for special reserve for probable contingencies. To emphasize, the board can only declare dividends if there are unrestricted retained earnings. That's very, very important. This is because of the trust fund doctrine, which again says that the capital stock of a corporation is a trust fund for the security of creditors and cannot be distributed to their prejudice to the stockholders. To be clear, the capital stock which should not be impaired by dividends is not the entire net assets but is the capital in the strict sense meaning the portion of the net assets directly or indirectly contributed by the stockholders as consideration for the stocks issued to them again the board can only declare dividends if there are unrestricted retained earnings and what are unrestricted retained earnings let's begin with retained earnings only which is the difference between the total present value of the corporate assets after deducting losses, liabilities, and the outstanding capital stock. It's the difference between the total assets and liabilities. And, it, and that difference is what is known as either the net worth or the net assets or the stockholders' equity. The retained earnings are the balance of the net worth or net assets after deducting the value the value after deducting the value of the outstanding capital stock okay it is the accumulated undistributed earnings or profits realized by a corporation arising from the transaction of its business or management of its affairs so those are the retained earnings now those retained earnings or portions thereof can become 
unrestricted retained earnings and therefore available for dividend distribution if they have not been reserved or set aside by the board for some corporate purpose nor are required by law to be earmarked for some other purpose specified by law. Okay? Like they could fall under the exceptions I mentioned earlier like when the corporation needs it for expansion projects prohibited by loan agreements, etc. In other words, they are surplus profits no? that are not needed to be set aside for a particular purpose. No? So to justify the declaration of dividends, there must actually be surplus profits over and above all debts and liabilities of the corporation. So earnings to be received but not yet received, they are not profits. Borrowings, they're not profits, hiniram mo nga lang eh. An increase in the value of fixed assets like land, no, the value increase, that's not profit, okay? And you cannot declare dividends from those. But a corporation may uh, declare dividends from a previous year, even if there has been no profits for the current year, especially to comply with the provisions of the tax law on improperly accumulated earnings tax, Okay? As a general rule, when it comes to dividend declarations, the participation of each stockholder in the earnings of the corporation is based on his total subscription and not the amount paid by him. De Leon gives us the example that if a person subscribes to 1,000 shares of, of, uh, with a par value of 10 pesos per share for a total value of 10,000 pesos, but he has only paid half, 5,000 pesos, what uh, what amount of uh, dividends will he get? He will participate in the dividends on the basis of his total shares, meaning the whole uh, the whole one thousand shares, and not on the five hundred shares or the five thousand that he paid for. Okay, why? This is because a stockholder's entire subscription represents his holdings in the corporation for which he pays interest on any unpaid portion. Subscribers are considered stockholders not from the time that they are issued stock certificates but from the time their subscriptions are accepted by the corporation. And again, why? Because it is from this time that they are bound by their subscriptions, subjecting them to all the liabilities and entitling them to all the rights of stockholders. It is only in cases where a stockholder is actually delinquent. And I discussed delinquency in another video already. Please just watch that. No, It is only where a stockholder is delinquent in the payment of his unpaid subscription that he loses his privilege to actually receive the cash dividends. Because the law says that any cash dividends due on delinquent stock shall be first applied to the unpaid balance of the subscription plus costs and expenses, while stock dividends shall be withheld from the delinquent stockholder until their unpaid subscription is fully paid. Okay? Now let's talk about the different kinds of dividends. No? A cash dividend is obviously no, a dividend which is payable in cash. In case of par value shares, they may be they may be paid at a stated percent, no, like ten percent of the par value. But it also may be a fixed rate per share. As to no par value shares, dividends are payable in terms of pesos or centavos per share, since there is no basis on which a percentage may be based. Remember that a stockholder does not have an absolute right to demand payment of dividends as long as the board has not yet set them aside and declared them. Huh? But as soon as cash dividends are publicly declared, then the stockholders have the right to receive their pro rata shares and the cash they receive becomes their absolute property which may not be reached by corporate creditors anymore. After declaration of the dividends, the stockholders may now claim payment of dividends as a matter of right, subject of course to the date specified for payment, no? whether it's a fixed date or on demand. Okay? Now, a property dividend is a dividend distributed to the stockholder in the form of real or personal property. It can be warehouse receipts, shares of stock of another corporation, etc. No? But the property distributed must form part of the surplus profits or retained earnings. 
Otherwise, it cannot be declared as dividends. And once the stockholder receives that, he can sell the property if he wants. It's his, no? And he'll realize cash from that. Okay? Now, a stock dividend is one which is payable on unissued or increased or additional shares of the corporation. Subject, of course, to the maximum number of shares which is authorized in the Articles of Incorporation. It is a dividend paid in shares of stock instead of cash and can only be paid out of surplus profit. By issuing this stock dividend, the corporation can retain earnings at it, as it involves the issuance of new shares to be distributed pro rata to the stockholders. In the case of stock dividends, the corporation transfers an amount from its, from its surplus profits or retained earnings to the capital account and it issues new shares which represent the transfer. In essence, the stockholder receiving stock dividends exchange the monetary value of their dividend for capital stock. And the monetary value they forego, the one that they don't take anymore, is considered the actual payment for the original issuance of the stocks given as dividends. So a stock dividend is actually two things. It is a dividend and it is the enforced use of the dividend money to purchase additional shares of stock at par. When a corporation issues stock dividends, it shows that the corporation's accumulated profits have been capitalized, no? added to the capital, instead of distributed to the stockholders. Instead of allowing the stockholder to realize profits right away, it postpones the profits in that the fund represented by the new stock has been transferred from surplus to assets and is no longer for uh, no longer available for actual distribution. So a stock dividend really adds nothing to the interest of the stockholder. The, the proportional interest of each stockholder remains the same. The, rep the stock dividend represents capital and does not constitute income to its recipient. And the mere issuance of stock dividends is not yet subject to income tax. I'll be going to tax a little bit, okay? The mere issuance of stock dividends is not yet subject to income tax because stock dividends are considered as unrealized gain, okay, which is not subject to income tax. Before profit is realized, stock dividends are nothing but a representation of interest in the corporate properties. In other words, capital. And as capital, it is not yet subject to income tax. There is no income yet. Now, for a stock dividend to be issued, aside from the majority vote of the board, it requires the approval of stockholders representing at least two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock at a regular or special meeting duly called for the purpose. Now, there are other dividends like optional dividends, which gives the stockholder the option to receive cash or stock as dividends. There's also uh, composite dividends or that which is partly in cash and partly in stock. There is no option to choose, no? There's also script dividends, which entitles a stockholder to payment of money at some future time. So it's like, but it's not exactly, it's like a promissory note. So the corporation is a debtor and the stockholder is a creditor before payment is made, okay? And the assets of the corporation remain the same because nothing passes yet. No payment will be made at a future time in case of script dividends, no? And other dividends would be bond dividends, preferred dividends, cumulative dividends, liquidating dividends, and participating or non-participating dividends, okay? So that's it for uh, power to declare dividends. Let's now move to power to enter into management contract. Now, first, what's a management contract? It's any contract where a corporation undertakes to manage or operate all or substantially all of the business of another corporation. So two corporations are involved, okay? And take note that the management contract should not be longer than five years for any one term except that in the case of agreements which relate to exploration development exploitation or utilization of natural resources the period will depend on the pertinent law or regulations on the matter 
Okay? So in management contracts, there are two corporations involved, which can be two totally unrelated corporations or even between a parent and a subsidiary or affiliate. Okay? Provided the purpose in that case, no, for parent and subsidiary, provided the purpose is to pro provide more efficient operation and greater convenience for both. In order for a corporation to enter into a management contract, there must be a majority vote of the respective boards of each corporation, yung dalawa, okay? which is ratified by majority of the stockholders owning uh, the outstanding capital stock or the members in both corporations. Okay, majority, majority, double majority lang of both corporations. Double majority here, double majority here at a meeting duly called for the purpose. However, take note, the law imposes a stricter requirement, more than the double majority I mentioned earlier, if the uh, the board decision, and the, there is a uh, stricter requirement, the board decision must be ratified by two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or two-thirds of the members in the following cases. In other words, in the cases that I will mention, hindi lang double majority, it has to be two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or two-thirds of the members in these cases. First, where a stockholder or stockholders representing the same interest of both the managing and the managed corporations own or control more than one-third of the total outstanding capital stock entitled to vote of the managing corporation. This is a case of interlocking stockholders. And the second case is where the majority of the members of the board of the managing corporation also constitute a majority of the members of the board in the managed corporation. That's a case naman of interlocking directors. So in case of interlocking stockholders between the two corporations or interlocking directors, what is required again is majority vote of the board and ratification by two-thirds Okay? of the stockholders owning the outstanding capital stock or two-thirds of the members of the managed corporation. Ha? Take note of the managed corporation. Okay? For the managing corporation, no problem, double majority lang ang kailangan. Okay? For the managing, the, the one that will be managing, the corporation that will be managing the managed corporation, double majority. Okay? Majority of the board, majority uh, of the outstanding outstanding capital stock managed corporation majority of the board and two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or the members okay so now we can move on to uh, the final topic for today ultra vires acts okay and what are ultra vires acts they, they there are three kinds no it can either be an act committed outside the conferred powers the express powers no or the purposes or object for which a corporation is created and in that case that's only voidable okay or it can be an act or contracts entered into in behalf of a corporation by persons who were not authorized no they have no corporate authority okay or the third that second one is also voidable and the third are acts which are per se illegal no they're illegal talaga okay so again the first two are not necessarily illegal they are voidable okay but the third one is illegal if the act or contract is illegal per se then it is wholly void okay and in inexistent and cannot be ratified or validated but if it's not illegal per se, but merely voidable because it is just beyond the power of a corporation or the person performing it on behalf of the corporation was not authorized, then it's merely voidable, okay? And, and it may be ratified, okay? It may be enforced by performance, enforced by ratification, estoppel, or some other equitable ground. As long as an ultra virus contract is executory, meaning not yet performed on both sides, it cannot be enforced by either party. But in case an ultra virus act has been fully performed, both parties have performed okay, on both sides, then neither party can lawfully set aside the same or recover what has been given. Why? Because both of them have already received the benefits of the contract. Okay? Nag-enjoy na sila. Wala nang sulihan. Okay, 
They have already received the benefits of the contract that they voluntarily entered into. And even the courts will not set that aside. They will not interfere with those contracts. But if an ultra-virus contract has been performed on one side and the other has received benefits by reason of such performance, it will depend on the circumstances, no? Sometimes, it depends on the facts of the case, no? Sometimes recovery may be permitted based on the principle of unjust enrichment, meaning that a party should not be unjustly enriched when the other party has not done anything, okay? Otherwise, the party who has received the benefits may be compelled now to return what he has received and uh, failing to do that, he has to pay the reasonable value, okay? In case of an ultra virus contract which is executory, okay, not yet performed, but was apparently authorized, no? Such as in the case where the president has been normally uh, entering into contracts on behalf of the corporation without need of a board resolution, no? Uh, that was the custom, no? There is apparent authority, but in reality, there is no authorization. Then the principle of estoppel will apply, no? The corporation will be stopped from claiming that the president has no authority, okay? Because in the past, it has already permitted the president to act on its behalf, okay? So, apply estoppel in the case of an executory contract with apparent authority. The test to determine whether or not a corporation may validly perform an act, you just consider the logical and necessary relation between the act which is performed and the corporate purpose or purposes as stated in the articles okay meaning the act is lawful meaning the act should be lawful in itself and not prohibited it should be done for the purpose of serving corporate ends and it should reasonably contribute to the promotion of those ends in a substantial and not fanciful or remote sense okay so the test is whether the act in question is in direct and immediate furtherance of the corporation's business fairly incident to the express powers and reasonably necessary to their exercise okay so that's it for my discussion on the powers of a corporation i hope you may have picked up a thing or two and i hope to see you next time guys see you soon bye